Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to uh, just mention a few words before I give the floor to our major speaker, Jessica Grounds. Um, today is going to be uh, mostly about um, campaigns and grassroots campaigning, but we're actually doing one more lecture at the Moravian Line Library, which will be focusing mostly on the, the process of the uh, elections in the United States, 2016, primaries, caucuses, etc. So if you're interested in a follow-up, and uh, we're also going to mention um, uh, the importance of the rising American electorate in the lecture, uh, obviously focusing primarily on women. With no further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the culture attaché of the American Embassy, Erin Kofheimer, uh, who's uh, accompanying us here on the trip, and most importantly, our guest speaker, uh, uh, Jessica Grounds, who is uh, going to speak now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Ahoy. Um, before I begin, I'm a very quick English speaker from America. And I'm going to be very ASCII here and ask all of you to move forward, because I have flown thousands of miles to come to Brno to speak to you. And Brno, excuse me. And I want you to come forward so I can see your beautiful faces. So people in the back, come forward. We in the US, we find these to be big barriers. So I said, I am going to step in front and speak to all of you. So first, I have to tell you all, a couple of years ago, my mom started doing some ancestry, um, finding out about our family history. My father is from Moravia, from just a very close by here, about an hour away. So I just want you all to know I have some connection um, to here. But I, um, so I have been working in the United States. I am from California, and I'm going to talk more about that. Uh, but I have been working in Washington, D.C., in our capital of the United States for the last 13 years. And uh, I'll tell you how I got into my work, but I feel very, very privileged to work in politics. I, um, have been, I've had the experience actually of working on Hillary Clinton's first presidential campaign. She ran in 2008, and you all are very, very smart and up on American politics. I've been talking to many Czech people, and you're very on top of it. And um, you all know she obviously lost in the primary to Barack Obama, who is our current president. But I have worked on a lot of campaigns. In fact, over the last 15 years, I've worked on about 1,000 races because of my campaign work. But my real passion and interest is actually on women's leadership in politics and getting more women and men to lead together. When I talk about women's leadership, it is not about being anti-man. It is about being pro-everybody. Just want to be clear about that. But um, let me get into my, my talk. I um, also want to thank the U.S. Embassy for inviting me all the way here to the Czech Republic. It's my second time um, here. I was here 11 years ago backpacking through Europe with my younger sister, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of American tourists do. And that time I was staying in a hostel, and now I'm staying in the nicest hotels. So it's nice to have a change of pace. So thank you again for being here today. So to start... Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. Am I speaking too fast? Quickly? Okay. okay. Be honest. And I should also say, I am going to ask, this is going to be some background about my work, but I really want to get your questions, and I want this to be a discussion. This is not going to be a boring lecture, I hope. States of America. I grew up in the southern part in San Diego. And from a really young age, I was always really interested in politics. Politics in the United States, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, is very much about personalities. There's lots of big personalities. You all may have noticed we have a particularly interesting uh, personality running for president right now, uh, Mr. Donald Trump. But, um, <laughs> um, but it's really something I've always been interested in. And when I was in college and university, and how old are, I'm sorry, how, are you all graduate students, undergrad? How old are you here? Age, throw out your age, yell. 20, 25, you're in your 20s. Okay, great. So when I was at your age, um, actually I was a little younger, I was 19, one of my first classes was a political um, campaigns class where I was on campaigns and elections. And part of my class, I had to work on a campaign. 
And now in the United States, political campaigns, they're a bit different than here in Czech Republic, but um, what's most important about them is the whole point is to get money raised so you can talk to as many voters about why you're the best candidate. So a lot of the money, and I'm going to talk about budgets in a second, doesn't get paid for staff. You don't pay the people to work on the campaigns, not very much, unless you're talking about the highest level races, like for president. But for a lot of races, it's people give their free time to go and help a candidate they believe in. So I had to go work on a campaign for my class. And it was this, um, yeah, it was actually a woman who was running for the California legislature. So um, we have 50 states. We actually, Hawaii and Alaska did not get neglected. They are there. So California, we have our own government in California. And then, we, of course, we have the national parliament or Congress, as we call it. And so I was working for a person who was running for the state government of California. And she actually won her re-election, um, thankfully. We helped work, work hard on her race. But I got really excited about campaigns. I thought it was a really great way to show um, people that, it, that politics matter. It was everyday, everyday issues that people were in, being impacted by. She was going to be their leader. But what I was most excited about for me was actually the idea that a woman could be in that leadership role and she could show people she was a strong leader and she was making decisions just like men. So I was like, well, this is really cool. I like this. I like that I, I can be a part of something which um, has a passion for making a difference. So what I started to learn, and um, this actually leads into my own kind of grassroots campaigning of my very first, how I actually started my own effort, I learned quickly that in the United States, we didn't have a lot of women in leadership in politics. So I'm going to ask you guys a question before I continue. Do you guys think that there are more women in leadership here in the Czech Republic or in the United States on the parliament level? What's your guess? U.S. more? What do you guys think? Okay, raise your hand if you think the U.S. has more women in leadership. Okay. Raise your hand if you think the Czech Republic has more women in parliament. Okay, you're right, the second group, by just a little bit. <laughs> we both have about 20%, right? So our 80% of our parliaments are made up of men and 20% are made up of women. So um, I started to realize that and say, oh, well, I kind of, I'd like to actually get more involved in helping more women be a part of it too. And one thing I think is really important to know, I, maybe this is something you guys have noticed here, in the U.S., a lot of the people who lead aren't just men, but they're older people. There weren't a lot of younger people involved in politics. I wasn't seeing people that looked like me, um, or looked like a lot, all of you, men and women, that were leading our decisions. And I was like, gosh, that's really an issue. I, don't, I think that's a problem. I think if our voices aren't a part of it, the issues that are, we're facing aren't being addressed. So I moved all the way to Washington, D.C. I'm sorry, I don't have a little laser pointer. You guys know where D.C. is, though. It's that tiny little, maybe you don't, but it's that tiny dot of, um, it's that up there. <laughs> it's very small. It's a little uh, kind of triangle. Leads the, leads the country. We're not a state. We don't have representation. In fact, our license plates say taxation without representation. In, uh, on our cars in Washington, D.C. because we pay taxes, but we don't actually have, a, we're not even a state. We're actually, a, we're, own or we're called the federal city or our own territory. So that's a big, it's a big political fight in Washington. So anyway, back to my story. I move with two suitcases. I know nobody, which is very crazy, but I did it. And I moved there to work in politics. I wanted to work on, I wanted to work on Capitol Hill. I never ended up working on Capitol Hill, but I've been in politics now for, like I said, 15 years. So when I got there, I thankfully knew, and I hope this is a lesson for all of you, that it's really important you network and you meet a lot of people. Because you never know who you're going to meet and how that person might help with your next step in your career. And so I had found out online and this is 2003, so it was like, you know, early. This is like, I wasn't even on Facebook yet. This is back in the day, right? No Facebook. And, or Facebook was around, but I wasn't on it. I found out on it from an email that there was a 27-year-old woman running for Congress. And I was like, 27, and she's running for, you know, the highest office in the land. So, okay, so we have two 
chambers like you do here, right? So we have the lower chamber, which is the House of Representatives, and then we have the upper chamber, which is the United States Senate. Between the two of those, that's 535 people. So every state in the union, does anybody know our senators? So we have two United States senators for every of the, all the 50 states. And then we have representation of, um, based on population in the House of Representatives. You have to be only 25 to run for the House of Representatives. So she was only a couple years older than the minimum age to run for this seat. So I went to go to an event to meet her because um, I thought it was really cool. She was running for Congress and she was so young. So I walk into the event and it was at like a pub or bar because that's where we raise money a lot is places where there are free drinks, right? And <laughs> it, this is meant to be a joke, so you can laugh. Um, <laughs> so there, but a true, true joke. So there was a big sign on the wall that said Women Under 40 Political Action Committee. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I had this like Oprah aha moment, and um, I literally did. I was 22, I remember vividly, and I walked in. So anyway, I got really involved with this group, Women Under 40 PAC, and the whole idea was that we weren't seeing enough women running for office. So as candidates, there's a lot fewer women running compared to men. So the numbers, there was a numbers problem, but we weren't seeing younger women running. And so my whole notion was, hey, we're not, the issues that impact women aren't even being talked about on the, one of the most important places that we're making the issues of our country. Let's support them. So I got really involved with this group. We were like, we're going to change it. We're going to help get all these women into Congress. It's going to be awesome. And then we realized we had a really big problem. Anybody know what our issue was? Yes. Money is a great point, and that is always an issue, yes, but that was not our biggest issue. We didn't have any young women running for Congress. We had like one or two. We're like, oh, right, okay, we need the, so what we started realizing was, and I, I'm, I'm not getting in as much of my gender talk today, but I have to share this with you guys. I, um, what we were not seeing was young women seeing themselves as leaders, right? Most of the time, the people you see in leadership are not women, and they're often not young people. And so you don't, you don't see that as an option, right? So, um, so in 2007, we thought, hey, we have an issue. So I co-founded Running Start, which inspires high school girls to think about leading in politics, which sounds crazy to some people, I get. And when we started the organization, people were like, wait, what? High school girls want to talk about politics? Um, really, truly, what we decided to do, though, is to help build their confidence in being able to lead and introduce them to politics. And so we started with 20 high school girls in 2007, and as of next year, I will have trained 10,000 girls and young women in the United States around leadership. The point of my story for all of you, and I'm going to talk more about campaigns now because I know that's what I'm supposed to be telling you about, um, but this, is, this was my own grassroots movement, right? So I co-founded this with my colleague. We saw a problem that we wanted to address, and we found a lot of people who didn't agree with us, but thankfully we found other people who did. And we brought them around us, and we started small, and we raised a little bit of money, and we started training 20 high school girls. And then the next year, I befriended Walmart, People, do you know who Walmart is? Walmart's the big, okay, do you guys have Walmarts in Czech Republic? Okay, no? Okay, well, they're a really big company all over the world. They have a lot of money, although they're not doing as well right now. But anyway, um, so I befriended their government people, and they've, they've now given my organization millions of dollars to train because they understand the importance of, of training women into politics. They actually get that. So my point is I found people who were, um, who supported me. And I think that's a lot about what grassroots movements are about, which is recognizing an issue, building on organic connections that already existed. So I reached out to women who, and men who cared about this issue, brought them together, and had a strategic vision of how we could fix it. So that's my first quick story on how I got into my work. But um, I'm going to transition now to campaigns. So. Um, Right now, we are in the midst of a presidential election in the United States. So did anybody know what yesterday is, last night, for the US? 
Yeah, you guys are very on top of our politics here. It's amazing to me. Yeah, so last night was Super Tuesday. Does anybody know what Super Tuesday was? Yes, well, so I think it's uh, the biggest run in the primaries, 11 states deciding who's going to be their candidate. Well done, yes. So we had, um, actually we had 12 states, one territory, but that was perfectly said, yes. Um, so last night we had a big primary. So does everyone um, know about how we have primary, have you guys kind of know about our structure? So we have two main political parties, Republicans and Democrats. Republican, Democrat, <laughs> just so you know. Um, um, and we decide in the primaries who our candidate is going to be. Um, Secretary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are the Democrats, and then we only we have five candidates left on the Republican side. This one over here, this fabulous gentleman, um, <laughs> supposed to be nonpartisan, right? Um, but um, he is leading the Republican Party, right? So he won a whole bunch of states last night, and Hillary won a whole bunch of states last night. So they're kind of the two in the lead, and. Um, Part of the reason last night was so important is it's a kind of the most, we kind of, we nominate delegates at our conventions, and if you have the most, you're likely to be your party's nominee. Um, but the bigger thing I wanted kind of to share with you all is in the U.S., you know, and you've seen this, but personalities are really powerful in campaigns. It almost is more, Trump's, haha, almost is more important than, um, than the political party. The political party, of course, is important. People do vote by party but personalities are really big. And you're particularly seeing this with Donald Trump right now because a lot of people, regardless of their political affiliation, are supporting him. And in some ways, I would say Hillary, although it's, I think, even more with Bernie Sanders, people are crossing their party lines and saying, hey, I'm, I'm gonna support someone kind of different more than almost the party. And I think that's something that's pretty unique about US politics um, that I wanted to kind of mention to all of you. Okay, so, um, as I said before, and I know you guys get into the nitty gritty, um, actually before I go on to this, wait, so tell me more about your, are you all studying campaigns here? Your marketing? No. Why did you guys come to listen to me today? You had to? You thought it was interesting? You wanna hear Americans speak? Why? I'm just curious, because I wanna hit, no, oh come on. Why did you come? because I study English and American studies and I wanted to learn more about the US elections first off. Okay, that makes sense. How about you? Mm, I'm interested in American uh, I want to find out something about American politics. Okay, great. Well, well we're on it. Okay, so, um, all right, so you guys got the campaign stuff. I wanted to make sure. Because sometimes I think this stuff's a little boring, but it's good for you to know. All right, so. When people run for office in the United States, a majority, and I mentioned this already, of the, we raise a lot of money when we run for office. And for example, when um, President Obama ran in 2012, he raised one billion US dollars to run for his presidential. That's a lot of money, right? Hmm, crazy. But that's what we do. Majority of our money goes to advertising, right? So when you run for office, it's kind of like marketing a person, a, a product, like a toothpaste. But it's not toothpaste, it's a person, right? It's marketing a person so that mo most people know about what you're about and who you are and why you're the best candidate for the job. That's a really part, big part of campaigns and how they're structured and how they get messaging out there. Um, so we use mediums or different tactics to get out there. So what's the main way in the Czech Republic people um, who are running for political office promote their candidacy? What do they do? What do they, how do they kind of get their name out there? How do people know they're running? Um, <clears throat> billboards? Billboards. Social media. Social media. That okay, cool. Right, we got that on there too. So in the US, we do a lot more than that, usually. We do um, a lot of campaign advertising on television, which is really expensive, because depending on where the television ad is going out, like for example, New York, very expensive media market. So if somebody wants to go onto television in New York and Ohio, which is the same media, mar media market, 
you have to spend, you have to raise millions of dollars to get on television, not just to actually make the advertisement, but actually to get it out there. And, and actually, Yana, maybe we could have shown a, a media ad, but we could maybe do that after. Because um, Hillary has some good ones right now. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe it's too late. I don't know. Um, okay, so television's really big, especially for presidential campaigns. We also do things like radio. The people get on the radio and have an advertisement about why the candidate's the best. This is what the money goes to, paying for this. Um, mail, when you get into, like when you come home from school or work or whatever and you open your mailbox and you get a piece of literature that actually is from the candidate, says why he or she's the best person for the job. That's a big part of how we campaign. Um, and then door to door, so actually knocking. We actually go door to door and we knock on your door and we say, I'm Jessica, I'm running for Congress, will you please vote for me? And you say, I think you're crazy or awesome, yes. So it's a very, very tactical effort when we run for office. Um, Milas and I were talking at lunch earlier about how we, I was asking, what do you think is the most interesting distinction between the US and Czech Republic or Europe and how we do campaigns? And he was saying data, and that's totally the case. So we, we know when people are registered to vote or not. We have information on people, if they voted before, do they get magazines? How much money they make? Do they like red cars or green cars? I'm not kidding, it's kind of scary. But we actually have data on voters and we are very targeted in how we talk to people. We actually really focus, depending on the candidate, who would be the best base of support for our candidate. And so we're very sophisticated in the United States on how we actually talk to the voters that um, we care about to vote for us. And then the last piece, and these are just kind of the big ones um, around how we reach voters. Uh, the last one, social media, which may not sound like it costs money because it's free to be on Facebook, it's free to be on YouTube, right? But we actually have people who are experts in targeting online, in doing advertising, and actually doing Facebook ads, and doing Twitter ads, and getting out there on social media. The one thing about social media to me is it's very passive, I think. So the other mediums are very targeted, like you basically can't run away from the phone call you get. You can't run away from your door being knocked on. But you have to go online, right? You have to actually seek out information on, on the social media uh, to actually get that content versus you know, being kind of harassed at your house. Does that make sense what I kind of described? Does, that, does, anybody, does anybody have any questions so far? Please. You better all have questions later or I'm going to be stomping around like a little kid. Yes. Wait, hold on. Uh, so you were talking about all the data you have about your, um, yeah, um, all the people, your voters. But what about privacy? I mean, it sounds really scary. Great question. Privacy, that whole thing. Yes. Um, okay, so... When you register to vote in the United States, you register by your state. I don't have my state map up there, right? So you don't register nationally. So you, but if you're from California or you're from Washington, D.C., you register for your state. And when you register to vote, all you give is your first and last name, your address where your house is, your phone number, maybe your email. That's it. So how did I find out that I like a green car or get this magazine or whatever? Um, we actually take commercial data, like if you, we have data on people's behavior on, on how they shop, on what kind of magazines they get, on how they behave online, and it is scary by the way, and we overlay that with people and we make matches based on our best guess, based on their email, based on their address, based on their name. We actually create files that are more robust than just the voter file. Does that make sense? So we actually, it's not always accurate to be honest, but the, there is an entire industry of this. So that's just to be clear on how that works. Privacy, it's a big, it's a big debate, but one of the most important things about this kind of stuff is we are very big into our constitution in the United States. And our first amendment is, is freedom of speech. That's, that's very, very important. Free, freedom of the free press, freedom of speech. We are very, um, 
I would say almost encouraged to speak out about what we believe in, in for in our country, a freedom of speech. And so political speech is considered supported and, and, and affirmed under the First Amendment of the Constitution. Court cases that have come up to the um, Supreme Court that have talked about uh, is this overreach, is this trying to go after our privacy, or is this freedom of speech? It's a great question, because it's very controversial. Some people say, well, I don't want to be harassed. Well, it's political speech, and that is something that's a big part of our country, that we should be able to have the right to speak to anybody we want to about, um, about voting and about being a part of the process. So that is my answer to that. Got it? Good question. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, you mentioned you overlay the data about the uh, shopping behavior with the data you have from their registration. Where do you gather the sh uh, shopping behavior data from? So that is, do um, you guys want the shopping behavior data? There is a big industry on selling products in our country, right? People want to know how people shop, what their behavior is, how frequently they go to the store, and actually commercial. So companies are finding that data. So for example, um, when you go to a lot of grocery stores, you sign up a little, um, you sign up a kind of a discount card to get cheaper products when you go to the grocery store. I don't know if you guys have that here. We have that, right? You sign usually your name, your address, your phone number, your email. Same as the voter data. So then all this commercial data is somewhere. The voter file campaign companies that are accruing all that will go to the people who are to, um, collecting commercial data to buy it. So there's actually companies that are, that are specifically oriented towards actually figuring out all this commercial information on the voter. The other thing is, is about eight years ago, um, actually a friend of mine named Hal Malchow, who's quite a bit older, he's been in political campaigning forever and ever, he started to model data, which essentially is a very sophisticated algorithm, like a formula, a mathematical formula, to figure out all of this data we have, how likely that person is to vote for our candidate based on what we think that person will be, that voter will like. So for example, I'm running for Congress in San Diego, right? One day, maybe I will. And um, I, my base of support is, is younger women, older women, um, men from the ages of 25 to 50, um, veterans, and surfers, I don't know, just made that up. People who like to surf, because I'm, I'm from the beach. And so um, I actually can model on our data, I can figure out a guess of which voters are most likely to fit that category for me. Does that make sense? That's kind of where we're going with our data. So it's really gotten sophisticated and kind of scary. Um, but I will actually say, and it kind of relates to, it relates to the presidential, um, I believe, and this is just my personal belief, part of the reason so well, fizzling out on me. Sorry, um, is because over the last 20 years or so, since we've been doing this super targeting, a lot of regular people who maybe don't vote all the time, um, aren't active, they have been left out of the process because the campaigns are so targeted and specific, they're only talking to people who vote every year. And so sometimes that means the campaigns haven't talked to a lot of other people. And I think a lot of the Donald Trump's type supporters in the US are people that have been left out. Does that make sense? Like we've actually, the targeting has actually led to them not being a part of the process, so they don't feel like their government listens to them, and they're mad, and so they're supporting somebody really reactive and not like the typical thing, because Congress has been um, having a lot of challenges getting anything done. So that's a kind of one of my views actually about why I think he's doing so well. There's multiple reasons, but okay. There was another question over here real quick, yeah. And then I'm gonna have to move on. Thank you. Uh, how do you target non-voters? If, you, if your campaign targets because you need to is it only through radio or TV? Is it enough? Great question. Is there anybody who can make this not fuzzy, or is that much to ask? That's just the way we're going. Okay, we don't know. Okay. Um, 
So how do we get people who are not voters to target them? Yes, so we do a lot of registration drives where we'll go, for example, college students, people your age, a lot of times they've never voted before because they are, you, can, you have to be 18 years old to vote in the US. By the way, it used to be 21, but it changed in the 1970s because people were being, actually in the 60s, late 60s, because we were sending young men over to Vietnam and they were dying that they couldn't vote for their country, but they could die in war. Pretty crazy, right? So, oh, thank you, friend. Hello, much better. Um, so, um, so that changed, I just wanna be clear. So when we go, we try to go to different areas, and this is actually another example of grassroots organizing. Instead of saying, okay, we're gonna go after all of these targeted people who are registered to vote, that's great, and we hope they vote, but let's actually go after the people who aren't even registered and get them to register and vote for us. That's actually a big part of how President Obama won in 2008. It's called a change the nature of the electorate. The electorate's who we expect to vote, the normal people, but he changed it, right? He got all of these young people engaged. He got, all, um, he got a lot of African Americans engaged for the first time who had never voted. They never cared, because you don't have to vote in our country. It's not compulsory. It's not forced, right? It's your choice. So we got all of these new people. So, so the way in which we do it is we go to places where there aren't a lot of people registered, maybe a, in front of a grocery store, in front of a school where moms are picking up their kids. Um, and uh, wherever we think students, again, is a big one, universities, trying to get new people registered and part of the process. So you register them and say, by the way, you get to vote and you should vote for me or you should vote for this guy or that woman. So that's the answer to your question, cool? All right, let's continue. And then I'm gonna have, but if you have questions, jot them down, I'll get back to questions for sure. All right, um, so I kind of talked about this already, but I'm kind of gonna go in the grassroots campaigning a little bit more. So, so really, 2008 was a big shift, as I've kind of already alluded to, in how campaigns were done in the US. Before 2008, we had, you usually had to, if you're really wanting to be politically active, like from the highest level, you would give a lot of money. You would give a big contribution, for example, because that's a way you'd get access. Or you would go to an event by giving money, usually. Um, and a lot of regular people didn't necessarily feel invested in campaigns. Like, well, I don't really feel like it affects me. I don't really, doesn't really, I don't really care. So one thing President Obama, at the time, Senator Obama's campaign did, is they said, and it was partly the emergence of online giving, right? Giving contributions or giving money on the internet through your phone. So it's partly technology that allowed this to change. But it wasn't these big events where you'd have to give all this money to be a part of it. You could actually give $3, or you could go you know, sign up with an email, and I'm gonna talk about this also, your email and you'll get a bumper sticker for your car or for your binder about the candidate. And so it made regular people feel invested for the first time, that they didn't have to give all this money that I felt, I felt like it mattered to me. Um, this is a, a great example of what a grassroots campaign looks like. It makes it, makes it uh, relatable to you. Another example of what he did um, and what the campaign did is they would go to normal places where regular people lived and worked. So he had a whole effort called barber shops and beauty salons, right? So where women are getting their hair done and where guys are getting their hair cut. And he would go in, and, or not he, not the president, but his staff, and he'd talk to regular people and say, hey, have you heard about this guy, Barack Obama? He's running for president. You should look him up. You should look him up online. Let's talk about it. We're going to elect our first African-American president, or we're going to change the way that politics works, or we need to come together, whatever the message is. And so part of grassroots campaigning is reaching people where they are, like regular people where they are, not feeling like it has to be way up here and you have to be this sophisticated person, right? Because a lot of, and I know this is the case in part here in Czech Republic, in a lot of places in Europe, a lot of places in the whole, in the whole world, which is, it, it only feels like politics is for people who are rich or come from a family or only a certain kind of person. That's not for me, I'm not a regular person. So that's the whole point of a grassroots effort is it's regular people coming together and saying, my voice matters, I care about this issue, I care about these issues and I want some change to happen. So that's 
that's kind of um, an, an example of that. Um, yes, okay, so let me talk a little bit about my work with um, Ready for Hillary. I ran Women Ready for Hillary, which was um, a part of Ready for Hillary. So um, does everyone know who Secretary Clinton is <laughs> in this room? Yes, right. Anybody not know? Okay. Right, so, so she's running for president again, um, and she, I'm a supporter. That's why I worked for her. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I was asked to go and run the women's effort of a group called Ready for Hillary, not just the women piece, just Ready for Hillary. And this was the whole idea of this new kind of grassroots movement. So we learned in the US that President Obama's campaign in 08 was really effective in getting regular people politically engaged for the first time, right? So when Hillary was not, she had not announced her presidency for this election in 2016, there was a group of people, two people in particular, and they said, Hillary needs a grassroots movement like President Obama had. She needs to get regular people inspired to support her. And more importantly, we don't know if she's gonna run for president or not, and we really want her to run for president because we think she's the best person. This is two volunteers, regular people. One's a, one's a police officer, one's a professor. An older lady who's like in her 70s, and a younger guy who's in his late 20s. And they started this group, Ready for Hillary. This is in 2012. And they said, we wanna, we wanna build a grassroots network for Ready for Hillary, I mean, for, for Hillary. So they decided to get together some of their friends and say like, what can we do? And so they did a very similar thing that President Obama did, which was using online advertising, asking people, hey, would you support Hillary if she were to run? Sign up your email. And if you sign up your email, you're gonna get a free bumper sticker. Or if you give a small donation towards this effort, you're gonna get a free bumper sticker or something. Yeah, I don't know, bumper sticker, that's what we gave. We gave out millions of bumper stickers, I don't know. So, do you guys all know what a bumper sticker is? Like a sticker you put on the bumper of your car? Okay, just making sure. So, um, <laughs> so I, was, I was hired about a year into the effort to really engage women. And you might ask, maybe not, but you might ask, why do you have to have an effort just to engage women? Aren't all people the same, men and women? Sure, to a point, like we all care about a lot of the same stuff, I agree, that said, in politics, I mentioned, remember my story earlier, women don't run for office at the same rate as men. They're not as politically engaged. That said, in the US, they are the majority of voters. The majority of voters, by far in some instances. So they're really important as a whole, but not all women are the same, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second in terms of what they care about. So, um, but because women engage differently, they don't give to political candidates at the same rate, they don't necessarily see politics as an avenue for change at the same place as a lot of men do, they need to be engaged in a way that makes them feel like they're a part of the process. And so that was my job. So what I did is I traveled around the country to build this early effort among women to say, hey, we need women to come together, bring your women, bring men, but like the whole, that was my job to say, hey, let's get Hillary to run for president again. We need you to reach out to your network of friends and be a part of this. We need to get their support early. Are you following this? Because I have to tell you guys, um, this was never done before. I mean, Barack Obama did it to win in part, but like this effort, Ready for Hillary, where we built this early grassroots effort and we didn't even have a candidate, like she hadn't even announced for president yet. We didn't even know she's actually gonna run. This was independent of Hillary, separate of her making the choice. This was people around her that cared about her running that built this network of support for her. So it was pretty cool because it never happened before and who knew it could have been a total failure. Thankfully it wasn't. We raised um, millions of dollars. We raised, I think, $13 million and $4 million emails, and that's a big deal, right? You have a list of people who will give to you and who will support your race for potentially running for president, and that's what we did for her before she even announced. So we were able to give her that information. Um, this is confusing for Americans, too, so I totally get it if you guys are confused at all. Does that all make sense, kind of what I was sharing? Am I speaking too fast still? No? Okay. All right. 
So yes, oh yeah, and 60% of our supporters of Ready for Hillary were women, which was a really big deal because that was the first time we had seen some, that kind of a level of effort in an in a organization like Ready for Hillary. Um, okay, the last piece I'm gonna have, and I hope you guys have a whole bunch of questions for me because I'm almost done. I already mentioned this, um, but I, women voters are the majority of voters in the US, and so in, the U and so in terms of how 2016 is shaping up, that's what's really interesting. Um, uh, if you wanna win for president, you have, to get more, you have to get more women to vote for you. You will not win. If you lose the women's vote, you will not win. It's kind of a big deal, which is good for me because I think that that will be bad for Donald Trump, but we'll see. That's just my speculation. Um, so, but not all women are the same uh, in terms of being voters, right? There's older women, there's younger women, there's, we have a lot of diversity. Um, in the United States, we have what we call the rising American electorate, which is unmarried women, African American, men and women, Latinos. Latinos will be 30% of the US population in the next few years, 50% of my state in the, the next 10 years about. Um, we have uh, Asian Americans, we have a very diverse population, and they typically vote more Democratic as a whole. Unmarried women, African Americans, Latinos, they tend to vote more Democratic, so that benefits the Democratic Party, but that's not always the case. Um, millennials are part of that. Millennials would be 30, how old am I? 33 and younger. That's a, that will be the majority of potential voters, meaning they will be able to be the majority of voters in our country. So that's a huge, 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 the rising American electorate is the majority of voters. And that's inclusive of a lot of women. And so, um, so I often talk about this because it's important for campaigns to recognize, again, as a campaign, you're not gonna just say, I'm just for women or I'm just for men. I just wanna make sure I'm being clear here. But there are differences in the way women have experiences in lives and men have experiences in lives, right? Women are doing still more of taking care of children and caregiving of family. Um, they tend to think more about pocketbook issues, what impacts my family's budget, a little bit more than men. They tend to be focused more on education. I'm speaking in generalities here. Um, men, while men and women both look at the economy at equal levels as the most important issues, they're also fearful of, in our country, terrorism. We had a big terrorist attack in California, pretty close to where I'm from, um, fighting ISIS, national security. So while the issues are quite similar for men and women, in the way we think about them, sometimes it's different how we approach them, how women engage and how they network with one, one another, and who they listen to, right? Like, who do you listen to? So I think it's really important, this is my personal belief, and I've actually written a memo to the Hillary campaign because I'm no longer officially on the campaign, but it's, I care a lot about it. I still work on, campaigns, on her campaign from here, here and there as a volunteer. Um, but I think it's very important that we talk differently to um, younger and older women because I think younger women engage differently than older women. I think we need to um, be effective in the way we're targeting. So I just wanted to reference um, women voters. Um, lastly, I've noticed this already, and I'm just going to put this out there, and this isn't just in Czech Republic. I've noticed this, and I've uh, been to a number of countries talking about this work. Um, when I'm talking about these things, I'm talking not black and white. It's not, this is right, this is wrong. I'm talking in thematics. And I'm talking in nuance. I hope that make, is clear, meaning just because I said this doesn't mean that's always the case, right? These are generally the themes we're seeing. And so I, as you guys ask questions, I will push back if you're very black and white in your thinking. Does that make sense? Like, well, it has to be this. This is good, this is bad. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. There's a reason it's called political science, right? It's the art and science coming together. Okay, so with that, I will take your questions. I hope you weren't bored. You kind of seemed like you were paying attention. You know you did, I'm just kidding, yes. Yeah, hi, I'm Honza. I'm a journalist for Moravské hospodářství. Uh, well, I'm interested in the organization point of view of that because you said it started two years before uh, she even uh, uh, said that she's going to run for president. Uh, you raised 13 million dollars, uh, four million emails. Well, and when you say grassroots, 
it's, it seems like some, something that's growing naturally, et cetera. But it obviously needs a lot of organization. So, uh, so, so how is that done? That's a great point. Right, I think um, the idea of grassroots is there's already an undergirding of interest, but there's not formal organization behind it. And I think that's the case with a lot of things, whether you're talking about politics or any other effort you want to make change around. So for example, there might be, you know, people are all really mad about how expensive tuition's here, I don't know. And people are all talking about it, but there's no outlet to make change about it. We can all complain, but there's no organization that says, let's go to the administration and say tuition's too expensive, or let's go to our professors and see who we can gather behind us to say this needs to change. So I think um, any good grassroots organization that is effective has organization. Now the trick that we had, and it's a really insightful question you have, was that we were not the Hillary Clinton campaign. We did not know if she was going to run, and we couldn't exact, excuse me, exactly speak for her because she hadn't like officially endorsed Ready for Hillary. She knew it was happening. She didn't say stop happening because she could have, and she didn't. So we kind of that's kind of a wink. This is good, but it was independent. Um, so we couldn't organize in the states like when she announces you're going to be the next state chair. You know, we couldn't tell people what their title would be and that they were going to be um, have a job with the campaign. But what we could do is create organization and support around her in that state so that when she did hopefully decide to run for president, that we could literally pass all the information and say, oh, Erin is in. Texas, and she's a huge supporter of Hillary, and she's on the list, and this is, this is all the work she did for Ready for Hillary. She's a perfect person to call to organize East Texas, right? So does that make sense? So you merge the, the interest that you, there's an undergirding of interest with organization, and you figure out strategy to like, to move the, move the ball forward. So yeah, that's what we did. Okay, what else? Yes. Um, Raphael, I'm from Britain. Um, you spoke about how it's important to uh, deal with younger women and older women in different ways. Is, could that leads into my question, which is why are younger women, especially whiter younger women, more um, find favor with Bernie Sanders over Secretary Clinton? So did you guys all hear that? Why are, there's a big, um, there's been a rift in the generations of support for Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton. Um, it's a great question. So um, in terms of my point that you have to message differently, I think a lot of older women have experienced sort of discrimination and they've experienced the challenges of leading in their profession or being who they are and being successful as women. And so they've experienced real life and they get that it's really powerful to have a woman, woman in part representing their country, the world, um, as the leader, and she is very, Secretary Clinton's very vocal about the empowerment of women and how it's better for all societies to have women and men leading, so she's very good, she's very vocal about that. They already get that, they've already, they've already experienced life, this is, again, my opinion. <laughs> Younger women as a whole, I think they care about those issues, but they haven't experienced those things, particularly in the U.S., I mean, we're raised in a very um, equal context where you can do anything the boys can do and you have all of the opportunities that boys have. We're at least taught that and we think that in a lot of ways, but it's not necessarily the case in reality. And so I think that, I think part of it is um, they are feeling empowered by the Bernie message of revolution, of issues they care about in terms of tuition but they don't realize the importance, I think, in the real kind of fight that I think Secretary Clinton means for them. And I think that's part of the generational divide. In some ways, it's a good thing. I'm getting here into my nuance here, meaning a lot of the older women fought for women to have the same rights that men had through the, through, in our country and through the women's movement. And the younger women actually are benefiting from all the work they've done to kind of create a more even playing field. And so in some ways, I feel like they should be like glad that they're just making the choice. Doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man. Um, but I think, I think the messaging needs to educate and inspire them that they will become empowered behind Secretary Clinton. And, and they're, they're feeling that with Bernie Sanders. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, um, 
um, it's a very interesting generational divide. Now, as a whole, women are supporting Hillary overwhelmingly. overwhelmingly. In South Carolina, she won 96% of the older African American vote. I've never seen a poll like that before. So she won 96% of African Americans over the age of 65. So it's a big, big support within the black community for her. So it's a good question, great question. Yes. Well, I have follow up. Uh, I read that Bernie Sanders did pretty well in Iowa and New Hampshire with women. So have you noticed any changes in Clinton's campaign after that? I wrote a memo. <laughs> I did actually. Um, uh, have I seen differences? No. Um, but I think that um, I think that what we'll see is more engagement. I'm hoping that we'll see more engagement among young women. Um, part of the challenge, um, part of the strategy, I would again suggest if you all are ever thinking about running for office or in terms of what's influential. You have to find what's influential among your voters. And again, for young women, I think they need to identify other young people that they already know that support Secretary Clinton. A lot of young people as a whole are supporting Bernie Sanders, so they hear from their peers. You should vote Bernie, he's talking about free education, and he's talking about a revolution, and he's talking about this. They're, that's who they listen to, which is great, which is fine. That's their peers, and they're politically active. I think we need to create, foster that more organically for the Hillary campaign. I think that's partly what needs to happen. Um, but have I seen any um, substantive changes? Um, not yet, but I sure hope that there will be. And I'm work. I'm. I'll. I'll be encouraging them to be. But it's very. You're. You're right. Um, thankfully, we're seeing again more support among women in the other states. So for her. Um, yes. Anybody else? Yes. I'm a student of international relations here, and uh, Katarina. Uh, and I would like to ask, like, what is, uh, in your opinion, the main difference between the first campaign uh, Hillary Clinton was running in 2008 and this one in this year? Great question. So did you guys hear that? For the difference between 2008 and this race, the number one difference is timing. <laughs> the one, number one difference is something she can't control. So I think a lot of times... People are like, well, what did he do wrong? What did she do wrong? You know, how could it have been different? And there's a lot of things that you can do differently, and there's cases where you can win an election because you did something wrong for sure. But a lot of times in politics, I find timing to be super powerful. So in 2008, we we're off the hills of the Bush administration. We had gotten into these wars, these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that the American people hate, they still hate. Um, and we wanted some change to happen, and we wanted um, that to end, for example. Um, we also had this young African-American, very eloquent man who we didn't really know very well because he wasn't, hadn't been in the public eye very long, that had these great ideas, and people could put their hopes in him. They could say, I, I think he could help change my life and make it better. And I think that's like nearly impossible to compete against, right? Hillary had been in the public eye for all these years. And, um, you know, candidly, my personal opinion, I think President Obama's been great, but I think Hillary came with, like, the tactical knowledge that I think our country needed in terms of being in a, a you know, running the country. I think that's what we need now in particular. I think we needed it last time, too. But, like, she couldn't compete against the timing of his presidency, of his potential presidency. So I think that's actually the biggest difference, which is not about what she didn't do, but, but about what she wasn't, which was not him. Um, and then the other thing that's very, um, I think this time she's talking more about not vote for me because I'm a woman. She's not saying that, but she is talking about how this is a meaningful thing. Our country is the representative in the whole world. And the fact that we could elect our first woman president, that's meaningful. Um, I think that's an undertone, but it's not the main thing. The main thing is she's the most experienced for the job. The number one issue on people's minds right now besides the economy is terrorism and um, national security. People are fearful of terrorist attacks in my city. We were, talk we were mentioned by ISIS as being the next target after um, California, um, Washington, D.C. So it's like very, like, Americans are kind of like scared, you know, we're like, oh, we so we need somebody who's going to 
take care of us. And I think that partly is why I think Hillary is really emphasizing her credentials as Secretary of State and what she's done around the world. So that's, that's another big, big thing for her. It'll be, if it's Barack, I mean, excuse me, if it's Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump, which it looks like it will be, um, I think the debates are gonna be hysterical. You guys have to watch them online. Because, like, he has no depth of knowledge of this stuff, and she's incredibly, the depth of knowledge she has is, like, very deep. So I think the contrast will be quite stark. But that doesn't mean people are going to vote for her. That's the scary part, I think. Anyway, it's my personal, hey, all right, friend in the back. How important will be voters not for Hillary, but against Trump, which will vote for Hillary? How important are people not just for Hillary, but against Trump? Well, um, that's a great question. I, um, I think that'll be very important. Intensity is really big. We measure intensity in polling, like how intensely you support someone or don't support someone. We can measure that. And it's very high for Trump. Like his people who like Trump really like him. People who don't like him really don't like him. There's like no middle ground, right? You either hate him or you love him. There's like, not, kind of like our Russian president, maybe. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, I was be careful. I'm not, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> I'll stop talking. So, um, I think that it's a, I think it'll very much help uh, to have people who don't like Trump to, but they have to vote. If they're Republican, I bet you a lot of them won't vote at all versus voting for Hillary. That's my fear. So I think we really have to encourage the anti-Trump Republicans to say, you have to stomach voting for Hillary because we have to not have Trump. The, the, um, so the establishment in Washington, the Republicans in Washington are really not happy about Trump at all. Like, I don't know anybody who supports him that I work with, which is a lot of Republicans. I'm married to a Republican. So like, he doesn't like him. He's like, can't even watch the debates. It's so embarrassing for him. So, um, so I think that that's a great point. I think that we'll, that'll probably be a big strategy of the Hillary campaign is to encourage those anti-Trump people to make sure they actually vote. And that'll be hard because they'll be voting against their party. So I think it'll be very important to answer your question. Yes. Hey, uh, I would like to ask you if you think that the last uh, John Oliver's uh, show will anyhow affect the campaign of Donald Trump. Trump. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I want that sign. That's quite pretty cool, right? You know, I hope he like takes it on the road. <laughs> um. I, I, I mean, I, John Stewart was really influential in American politics, I think particularly around young people. I don't know how John Oliver doesn't have the same following. So um, I think that kind of parody, though, will elicit a lot of reaction from people who are rational in thinking, and um, I think it's funny. Humor is really effective in politics if you can bring in humor. I mean, that's the great thing about them. So. I don't know really how powerful it will be, but um, if we keep doing spoofs like that, maybe it'll have some impact. I don't know, but it's, it, that was hysterical. Loved that. Yes. Uh, so at one point, Secretary Albright at one of Hillary's events uh, said uh, that women who don't vo vote for Hillary have a special place in hell or something of, of that sort. Precisely. Uh, so w what's your take on uh, women voting for Hillary uh, mainly on the grounds of just being a woman in, in the White House? I got asked this on television last night. Maybe you saw it. <laughs> um, so, um, so Malcolm Aubrey has been saying this for the last 20 years. I, to be quite fair to her and to, I think, me, I actually think it's important for women to support one another. Do I think people are gonna burn in hell if women don't support Hillary? Absolutely not, but um, um, I, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek funny what she was, she was kind of, but she, what she's saying is, and I think that this is important conversation for men and women to hear this here in Czech Republic around the world, I think it is important for women to support and uplift each other and say, hey, we're credible 
capable leaders just like men, but that doesn't mean at the ballot box you should be feeling like you're an anti-woman if you decide to vote for Bernie Sanders, even though I'd hope women decide that Hillary is a better choice for them from all these other reasons. Um, that said, um, so hear me out. I don't tell people to vote for a woman candidate because she's a woman, but because a candidate is a woman, I think it matters, right? Okay, so don't vote for a woman candidate because she's a woman, but because she's a woman, woman candidate it, or a woman, it matters to her leadership. So that's part of my work, which is I don't think the Czech Republic, the United States of America, Germany, anywhere in the world, any country in the world, will be as strong as it could be, as effective, efficient, productive, unless we have more women and men working together to lead our country. I really don't believe that. In fact, if you look at the research in companies, companies that have the most women in leadership are making more money. Some of the most, the most efficient, effective countries that are tackling terrorism, climate change, economy, economic problems, have women and men working together. Now, will that mean 50-50? There's a lot of binds around, double binds around women in the work and home and all this stuff. That might be hard to achieve tomorrow, but I think it's a goal we all should be working for, and that's not an anti-man thing, that's a productive thing. So the nuance behind this is much more nuanced. It is not anti-man to say, go women, I think. I, I like women to support each other, but, um, but it's a conversation that comes up and it gets very, like, again, black and white, like I said. You're for women, so you're against men. You're, you, you know, this one way or the other, and I just think it's a little bit more complicated than that. But most importantly, I think it, for me, having Secretary Clinton as our president is gonna, we've never had a woman president, it does matter that she's a woman. Like, that actually is very powerful, that she can show the world that women can be in the most, most um, powerful, expansive job. That is important. I don't think anyone here can deny the fact that we elected the first black president was powerful. I mean, that I think changed the hearts and minds of a lot of little boys and little girls who are like, oh my gosh, I can do that now. If you don't see a woman in leadership, you as a little girl may not say, think I can do that now. That, that matters. So that's what I think about that question. Okay, um, how much time do we have, Yana? Okay. Unless I pass out, you guys are asking so many good questions. Yes. Um, I think um, with the last question, you maybe partially un answered my question, but my question was, was how do you convince women to um, become more active in politics and support Hillary? Because um, what you said, um, I personally don't think you should say, uh, you should, uh, should vote for Hillary because she's a woman, because I think you, uh, need to make the best choice, um, whether the candidate is female or male, because I don't like it when people tell me I have to vote for a woman because she's female or that there has to be a set number of um, leaders in, for instance, companies, because I think that is, um, is um, yeah, because it, it uh, yeah, maybe prom yeah, it seems forced, and it actually promotes the the, the idea that uh, men and women are different. And I think the thing about um, is uh, what you want to promote that they are equal, right? This stuff is complicated, so I'll have a job the rest of my life. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, again. I think that our countries will be more effective at addressing the problems we're facing if more women are in leadership with men. Women are 50% of the population. And it's not to say, it's, again, um, I don't argue the just, ar I think that the, you know, the justice argument that women should be there because we're half the population is totally fine. It's not what I argue. I argue that we will make more efficient decisions that actually address the issues of our whole countries, our whole country here in Czech Republic, our whole country in the United States, when women or men are there together. Research also supports these notions that men and women are together, can be more effective in their decision making. Women are actually really problem solver oriented. Sometimes when there's a lot of like, oh, let's just talk about like egos, not to say all men are about egos, but you know, you have a different sort of an approach 
So I actually would say men and women do have a difference in style, leadership style as a whole. I'm talking in generalities here. Of course, sometimes there's women who are very male in their style, and there's men who are very female in their style, if you will. So I think we have a little bit more of a confluence here. But again, um, I believe we will not make the best decisions and address all of the issues impacting women and men in families if we do not have more women in leadership. So for example, our country, my, I'm talking about in the US now, I'm not speaking in the Czech Republic because I'm not an expert on Czech Republic. Um, our system of the way our workday works is very old school where there was one parent who worked and one parent who stayed home. Typically the guy worked and the woman um, stayed home with her kids. Now the, in the United States, almost half of the breadwinners in our country are women. So the structure does not work to fit the reality of the economy we're in. And so if that is where we are and we're trying to create an effective economy that supports all of the people, structures have to change. We have to break them down. I also think, as I mentioned before, companies will not make as much money and be as productive and enlightened and actually make better product and grow their product unless we have more women in leadership. We are not gonna be addressing the fact that three, um, three uh, quarters of people in low-income households are women making the lowest amounts of money. The, a lot of the research suggests if women were employed like men in the world, we'd actually add $200 trillion to the global GDP. So this is a, there's a monetary benefit by having this, not just the right thing to do. So I think we're missing the perspective, we're missing those voices. So, so to answer a question about Hillary, again, I'm not telling a woman, vote for her because she's a woman, but she is going to help you become more empowered as a human being. That's what she cares about. I think that's what, that matters to me. I also think she's doing awesome work for men too, small business owners, education. Those are all issues that a lot of men care about. So everyone has to make their own choice about that. Um, but I think we have to look not so men, women, uh, different. It's about the entire society being uplifted when we actually use the talent pool of the entire population. We are not using the talent pool of the entire population. Okay? All right. Can we take, what, two more? Uh, why, do <laughs> why do you think that uh, Hillary would be the best? I mean, what qualities, many qualities she has and other don't, like Bernie or someone else. That's great. I mean, I think, um, well, it's hard to say on the Republican side, but I think they have great qualities because I'm pretty partisan here on this. Um, although I really like John Kasich from Ohio. Um, I think Hillary has the best qualities, I think, for, for two main reasons. One, because of the global threat we have right now in the world. I think the United States as much as Americans do or don't like it, we often are in the middle of problems that impact everywhere in the world. Um, as President Obama has said, like when, sorry, I'm gonna cuss, shit goes down in X, Y, or Z country, the United States gets called. And we get asked to be involved, usually because we have the biggest military and we have a lot of money and da 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 da, although we have a big debt right now. <laughs> um, so I think Hillary has the, um, understanding, the sophisticated understanding, the challenges that have been impacted by our world um, better than anyone. Uh, I think she has the robust knowledge of every piece of the planet, and frankly, she really does. If you hear her speak, she's incredible um, about this stuff. So I think, I want somebody who's well-equipped to handle all of the problems that we see and re recognizes those challenges. That's like first and foremost to me. Um, I also think she understands the changing demographics of our country. We have a much more diverse country than a lot of countries. We have a much, we have a big, we have a lot of young people, as a lot of countries do. And I think she understands what kind of policies from the federal level need to change to support families, to support the changing ways that men and women are working, how um, children are being raised, all of these things. Um, those are issues she deeply understands and under, and gets. And so. For me, those are the two main reasons. I just think she has the most breadth of knowledge and she's literally would be ready to go to make choices right away when she stepped into the office. So, And I want to see a woman president. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would like to ask you one more uh, about uh, Congresswoman Stefanik, who was uh, elected from New York. Uh, 
uh, why do you think a, a young woman was elected from the Republican Party in opposition to the Democratic Party? Yeah, so Elise Stefanik, she is the youngest woman ever elected to Congress from New York, from anywhere in the country, but she's 30. Um, and you can be a Republican and be a young woman and still be you know, politically active. You don't have to be a Democrat. I mean, um, I think <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so I think she, uh, that's, she was part of the Bush administration. She worked for um, George Bush. And uh, she's conservative, that's what she believes. I mean, the biggest difference between the two parties are small government on the Republican side, right? Less government, less taxes. The Democratic side is more European in style or interested in more government helping to support, you know, the government can help families and things like that and support society. Those are the two conflicting sort of philosophies. So there's a lot of young people who support the Republican kind of approach to fixing things. She is a little bit more moderate, I would say, on things. She's not like a super conservative, conservative Republican. Um, but she, um, but it's great. It's great to see that. In fact, uh, the group, remember the very beginning of my story, I walked up and had my Oprah aha moment, women under 40 pack. That group is bipartisan. And actually the work I've been doing as partisan as I am married to a Republican, I obviously like Republicans, but I also have been doing a lot of work to support Republican and Democratic women running. So that group, Women Under 40 PAC, is non-issue based, supportive of women and re women Republicans and Democrats actually getting supported. So that's very important to me, it's very personal. Um, and um, I can still go to the ballot box and vote for my Democrat because I'm a Democrat, but that doesn't mean I don't think it's good to change culture and actually have um, women of both, both political parties more involved. So that would be it. Um, okay, with that, I think I'm done, and I hope you, thank you for being such an amazing audience. I wish you all the best with your studies and whatever you end up doing in life. Just know you're a role model to other people as peers and other people in your life, and I hope you continue to do awesome and work, and thank you for listening. So thanks for having me today.